Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the 311 Odyssey podcast. I'm your co-host, Ark Sensor. Today we have uh, B-Love, a little under the weather, so he won't be joining us today, but we have our co-host, Jenny, over here. How are you doing today, Jenny? I'm doing good. And today we're going to talk to Dan Frazier. You might know him as a drummer from Sugar Ray, or you might know him as a winner of BBC America's Chef Race. We're, we're happy to have you, Stan. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, what's up? How are you guys? All right. Uh, All right. Hey. Hey. Golf, golf clap, golf clap. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing wonderful. Happy to have you today. Thank you for joining us. So, Of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm out here in uh, Southern California. I think we just hit like 70 degrees today. We've had rain here for the last couple of weeks, so we got our sunshine back, and, uh, you know, I'm a happy guy now. Beautiful. Yep. Well, go ahead That's and get us kicked off. Better than the snow we're getting, getting ready for. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm uh, trying to head to Norva tomorrow, and I'm, I'm glad to be going south, so I'll, sh- I'll probably be driving away from it, but they're saying there could be delays tomorrow, four inches or so. So. Well, uh, yeah, get south if you can. Oh, yeah. I, can, I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's jump in with a little bit of your music history and how you kind of got your start in music. Sure. Um, it's funny because my I have an 18 year old daughter who's kind of doing her due diligence on on uh, who her dad is. You know, she's at University <laughs> of Arizona, but she'll send me all these clips from YouTube. Like, Dad, I didn't know you did this. Dad, I didn't know you did that. So, um, I just watched. I watched a couple of these things the other night, and it brought back such great memories of um, you know how I did get started and how our band got started. You know, way back, you know, 150 years ago, back in the covered wagon days of uh, Sugar Ray. But um, <laughs> You know, I, I grew up in in, in uh, uh, this community um, in Orange County. Uh, we're we're from the hard hard streets of Newport Beach, where it's uh you know you don't get your first BMW till you're 16. <laughs> um, so it's a uh, it's a it's a funny place to live. Um, you know, I had a job when I was 13 years old, and and uh, a lot of the other kids in the neighborhood, you know, that they didn't have to to work or do anything. But uh, from a very early age, I was surrounded by music. My mom was a singer. In college, uh, she got a vocal scholarship from out of high school into college, and she did like all the. Um, she played like four or five instruments, like ukulele and piano and guitar, oh. and, and she was a hell of a singer. And um, so I, I like to say I got like ten percent of her talent. You know, um, she was really an incredible musician, and and uh, you know she basically got me into music. Um, my brother, who was a few years older than me, I'd listen to put my ear up to the wall and he, he was getting into like Elvis Costello and a lot of 80s Devo and you know the blasters and all this stuff oh, and, wow. and it just it resonated with me so hard because my older brother was like vibing on this music and then my mom would be like she was encouraging me like hey do you want to play an instrument you know um, my dad was like a southern uh, lawyer very conservative and he wanted nothing to do with music he would walk into our rehearsal space and say uh, do y'all know Far, Far Away? And we're like, no, what's that song? He goes, no, I mean, can he play Far, Far Away from here? You know, get out of here. You know? no. So he, he was, he he definitely didn't enjoy like me trying to become a musician, but my mom was always backing me and, and supporting me. Thank, thank, thank the Lord. Awesome. Yeah. You know, uh, they've both, they've both gone to, uh, to rest, but, but um, I have the memory of, of them supporting me. So I got into it in high school, started playing in, you know, garage bands and all that stuff. And suddenly you know uh after like i guess my junior year we, I, you know we kind of started playing and mark mcgrath came into the fold and murphy our bass player came i was dating murphy's sister oddly enough and and i said who's your brother because he's this rad bass player and he had this he had like a mullet and he had a pink ibanez bass and he was just this crazy kook and we loved him so i just said hey murph let's start a band and then we i was playing with rodney who was our guitar player in in high school bands and um, one day, uh, I guess this guy who was singing for us didn't show up, and, and Mark jumped up on stage. He had a rat, the band Rat. He had a rat cut off T-shirt, and he did a backflip into the pool. And we're like, "You're our singer. <laughs> like you're, you, you have you have so much charisma. You can't really sing to save your life, but but man, you look good jumping into the pool, and the chicks sing to dig you. So we uh, we enlisted Mark as the singer, and and that mm-hmm. was pretty much the beginning of the end for us. I mean, we we started playing like uh, high school parties and college parties. We were big on the the fraternity and sorority parties down in San Diego and Santa Barbara. So it just kind of grew. And and we didn't really have that many originals. We just had like covers and, but we were like crazy. We would come out and Mark would climb up to, to the rafters and he would bring a hockey stick on stage and we'd be checking people. And it was, <laughs> it was shock value, you know, it was like just right. crazy. We were punk rock, but we loved the beach boys. And, you know, we also loved, you know, Johnny Mathis and we loved the sex pistols. Like it was just all over the place for us. And, 
very evident when we made our first album like we really didn't know who we wanted to be we only had a few originals and so our first record was like all over the map i mean you had a punk song a rock song a country song a jazz song like we were just like and our record label was like what do we do with this crap we don't know how to market this <laughs> so you right. know that record actually didn't do very well um i like to say it went double copper <laughs> and um you know we, they sent us over to europe and and we like struggled in, in these bands and, and we were in Germany for weeks at a time and it was like negative 20 and playing in front of 10 people at some club and it it was kind of great but at the same time it was kind of miserable you know right just to be to be in Germany playing music like I thought we'd made it I'm like we made it we're in Germany playing to six people but um you know we had a long road to go but um those were some of the the things that kind of got me into it and you know I kind of fast-tracked it but you know lots of ups and downs and hiccups and um, you know, it's, um, it's in your blood. I mean, you know, I'm still, I'm 55 years old as we speak right now. And I'm still, I'm advancing a show for my new band right now. We're playing uh, on Saturday night. And so it's just one of those things that gets in your blood. And if you're a musician and you have a love for, for music and all things, you know, that, that surround it, it, it never leaves you. So I'm really lucky. And, and we've had, we had such a great blessed career and, and, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's how I got into it. My, my parents and my brother and, and uh, my friends. And, you know, I wasn't really a jock per se. So I was like into music. I mean, Freddie Mercury was like my, you know, my, uh, my he, he, he was the Super Bowl for me, you know, just, just to speak of a recent current event. You know, he was my, right. he was my guy. So anyway, that, that's how I got into it. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, it's oh, perfect. Okay. That's... Yeah, that's what we're looking for. I actually just saw Almost Queen over in Reading, Pennsylvania last weekend. And uh, the guy who does that, uh put on a pretty good show he he had the voice he had the the flamboyance and the, the feeling uh and then brian maybe was on point with his stuff so yeah good that's thing. a great name i i don't i'm not familiar with them but we have a few of those queen tribute bands out here and we always go see them it's fun it's there was a van halen tribute band that we went and played with the other a couple of years back but yeah i mean it's just uh even those kinds of things. I, I'm still like such a fan of, of music that I will go see stuff like that. I'll go see original acts or whatever. My daughter would tell me about someone new to go check out. And, and I'm always, you know, I've produced a lot of records in my, in my past and I still do an occasional like run where I write and produce stuff. But, um, you know, it's, it's in my blood, man. That's all I can say. It's like, you know, it, it, it provided me with a really good life and, and uh, we chased our dreams. We got the doors shut in our face a million times and, you have to be resilient and get back on your feet. And, and if that's what you really want to do, there, there's a way and, and you just got to figure it out. Nowadays, though, I, I have no idea with, with streaming and, and downloads and, and you know, all, I just it's such a it's such a changed world. But I'm so blessed that we had that, um, you know, that that stroke of luck that, that we we rode for, you know, 25 years, basically. Music's in your blood. It's it's hard to to escape the emotion that it invokes in you. You know, like if, if you're open to it, it's going to be there for the rest of your life. So. That's that's great to hear. So uh, you're you got your success. You're finding your identity. You're playing some Europe tours, and then when's the first time you heard of Three Eleven along the way? Uh, my my story about Three Eleven predates that stuff by by several years, maybe a decade. So Love to hear it. There, yeah, there was a there was a club in Huntington Beach. So the our band before Sugar Ray, we were called the Shrinky Dinks, and we were. We were like this cover band, and like I said, the hockey stick, and we were doing Judas Priest, and we were doing Zodiac Mind Warp covers, and we were playing, you know, Blondie covers and all this stuff. But we, we actually had two or three originals, and we would play this club in Huntington Beach, California, called Night Moves. And before that, or after that, it was called 5902. It was in a, a strip mall in the corner of this little rundown uh, place in Huntington Beach. And um, we would go there like we actually would we saw like the Chili Peppers with Hillel Slovak back in the day. And, mm. you know, we would just go there on a Friday night just to see bands. But then we would play there occasionally, too, and bring all of our friends and sell the place out. So we were we were patrons of the club at the same time. We played at the club and we knew the owner. And so one night we heard about this band, you know, from Nebraska. And we were like, we have to go check them out. They're called 311. And, you know, we were like the local hometown guys. So when we would go there, they would give us free drinks and people would be stoked that we were there and we'd be high-fiving mm -hmm. our friends. And sure. And then, you know, we're out front waiting for 311 to kind of like pull in. We thought like maybe they'd have like a, a Ford Econoline van and, and, you know, maybe a trailer. And they were this national band that everyone was buzzing about. And seriously, like around the corner, here comes a giant like 45-foot Prevo tour bus 
into the parking lot of this this shithole club in the middle of Huntington Beach, and we we're like, "You've got to be kidding me!" This band has a tour bus. At, at, at that time, we were like, you know, we didn't even have a van. We yeah. were just, you know, we mm-hmm. had our cars. I had a broken down Volkswagen, you know, Jetta or whatever, and we. But this band pulls around the corner of tour bus. Our mouse hits a, a ground. <laughs> we were like, "What?" So we didn't really know how big they'd already become in like Nebraska and on the on you know in Midwest and. We mm-hmm. were shocked that that like they had that kind of money and that that kind of following and sure enough like we as soon as they pulled in you know 500 600 people like showed up and there was a buzz I don't know how people did it before cell phones and the internet you know but right. but um they they were a, a marketing force to be reckoned with even back in the day you know grassroots I mean that's just you know they spread the word and they played you know religiously and they sold merch and they, they we we were like we couldn't even believe it and of course they put on like the best show ever and all, we went back to the drawing board we're like oh my god we suck so bad you know we gotta we gotta like step up our game like we're not doing everything wrong we have like four fans and this sucks and so they were super inspirational back in the day and, and that was the first time i heard of them and then we were like after that we were just just scratching our heads like how the hell do they do this you know like how do they get this following and they're on they have a tour bus and they have all these people outside and they're selling all these merchandise like it, it was truly a, a, a sight to see back then come in and, and 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 peacocked with that tour bus you know we were like oh okay. and then we finally got a gig we finally did get a gig with them after we i think got a, our, our record deal with atlantic but by that thing every you know by that time things had changed for us things had changed for them they were sizably bigger and i couldn't even believe they were playing that venue was, i think they went from that thing in 94 to probably like a shed like the next year i mean they, they blew up with yeah with all you know so so do you but remember it was, it was super cool to super cool yeah i was gonna say do you remember any uh you know experiences or or anything that went down in those first few shows that you were with shrinky dink and opening with them uh and how many actually were there under that name shrinky dinks i mean I, that that was the only show that, that we saw that we were just like oh my god and it was the original band i mean it, and they were all like in mm-hmm. high top socks and they had shorts and you know buzz cuts and they were they were rocking out and they were all in like sync and we were just like man these guys have like they've already figured it out like they had such a formula and it was like, I mean, it was just infectious for us. Cause like our shows were always chaos. Like, you know, a guitar might not be plugged in. Mark might climb the rafters. Someone might not show up. It was just organized chaos. And <laughs> most of the time it went well, but like there might be a pit and someone might get like hurt and like they might stop us. So, but 311 was just like, they were fluid. They knew what they were doing. They just seemed like such pros. And I, you know, at the time, I mean, they were probably our same age or maybe even a little younger, but I, they just i don't know they just had it together and it was just like wow but i, I don't remember any interaction with the guys I, I think they were they they stayed i remember they stayed and signed after the show um and they had a huge line of people trying to get their you know their t-shirt signed or their their uh, i don't even know if they had cds i guess cds were just coming out of where maybe they were out for a while but they were just they, they were there and they were present and they were talking to their fans and i think you know that's the reason why they're so you know popular with with everybody is because they love their fans and the fans show up for them and the fans buy their merchandise and the fans buy their tickets and the fans support them. And it's such a cool thing that, you know, they've mm-hmm. taken it to like, obviously the stratosphere and back. Um, so I always remember how cool it was to see the tour bus and then to see them outside in the, in the, you know, night after the show, like probably cold and sweaty signing autographs for, you know, what seemed like hours, you know, we, we wanted to wait and go talk to them, but by that time they had to get on the bus and bail, but right. super cool. I always thought that was bitching. <laughs> so there were some dates in 94 right for Huntington that they played with some other bands Jenny yeah there was a whenever Shrinky Dings played I guess it was supposed to be Sublime and um, Shrinky Dings and 311 but Sublime no showed and we, we actually talked to uh, Ty Zamora who's the bass player from Alien Ant Farm and he said he was there and um, that extra large with um Oh, Warren from yeah, Warren from the Vandals and Warren yeah. from the Vandals was yep. filled in. He was saying how much of an experience it was to see. I, I can't confirm that. I, I he I know Warren was probably there. I mean, Mark, we we showed up for sure, and I, maybe maybe Warren jumped up and played a song. I don't remember, but um, yeah, I, and Sublime at that time too. That was because I remember. I mean, yeah, there there, there there was some pretty heavy drug use going on. I think between Bradley <laughs> at that time and. I mean that's right when we got signed, and then yeah, a few a few years after that, I mean you know we lost Bradley like you know that that yeah. was so that that was there was definitely um, a lot going on back then and a lot of 
murkiness and, and craziness. And like I said, we saw the chili peppers there probably not too, too much before we saw 311. And, and again, they had, they were big, but they weren't that big yet. And they had like Hillel Slovak, their guitar player. And we were all in the Mexican restaurant next door to, to, to uh, 5902. And, and it was, they would serve you beer in this restaurant, even though you had a, like a really shitty fake ID, you know? And so we're all in this Mexican restaurant getting ready for the chili peppers. And, you know, we're probably 18 or 19 and, and we're in there like drinking beers on our fake ID. And we remember, I totally will never forget this. And you can ask any guy in Sugar Ray. Hillel Slovak came in from Chili Peppers and went directly, didn't eat any dinner, didn't get a beer, went straight through the restaurant into the bathroom and was in there for like 45 minutes. And we're like, <laughs> oh, shit. And so, oh, no. you know, yeah, he was in there doing some some needlework, um, you know, not good stuff. And we were like, oh, my God, this is bad. So we finally, like, knocked on the door and he, like, came running out and he, like, ran back into the club. But it, it was not good. Like, those are some of the days I don't want to remember. It was just gross and dark. But, yeah. like, the 311 pulling up in the tour bus, that was certainly yeah. bitching and really cool. And, and you know, the beginning of, of what, you know, was to be a cool relationship between, you know, Sugar Ray, 311, Incubus corn no doubt all, all those bands i mean you know orange county had like you know it was a crazy run of of bands and and artists and performers that came out of this little area in orange county it it, it kind yeah. of still does rage against the machine i mean you name it it's like holy crap sublime i mean it's the the list is endless it's crazy well so, i don't know something in, something in the water down here i guess you guys yeah <laughs> Well, it's definitely uh, we're, we're glad it happened. Uh, Ty had also yeah. mentioned that that show with uh, Extra Large and, and Sublime dropping uh, was his first time ever seeing 311. So that was yeah. that was a cool little yeah, story cool. that ties in. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely. That, that everyone was kind of like, like I said, six degrees of separation. Like I didn't even know Alien Ant Farm, but I I think we probably stayed and partied and met those guys, and you know, it, it was it was a small knit community. So it's like you knew kind of everyone from a distance and. Like you said, the extra large guys, the penny pennywise guys were in the house, the mm -hmm. the guys from, you know, this, that and the other. I mean, we all kind of like were aware of each other and stoked on each other and, and, and like, hey, like, you know, we're all in this together. Like I hope some of us make it. I hope some of us can like survive this whole era and, and uh you know, but that that was a, a really cool time. I mean, it brings me yeah. brings me back. It was it was really cool, guys. Yeah. Well, let's jump over over to 1997 with the Transistor Tour. So you guys go out on tour together. It's 311, Sugar Ray, and Incubus, and all of you are supporting albums. 311 is supporting Transistor with Beautiful Disaster. You guys and Sugar Ray are supporting Floored with uh, Fly, and Incubus has uh, the Science album out and has like songs like a, a Certain Shade of Green. Like, what a time. So much great music. Anyway, um... Do you have any specific memories that come to mind from that tour at all? Or what was your perspective of, of that tour? I mean, of course I have um, different memories and, and you know, uh, anecdotes and stuff from that tour. It, it was like, uh, that was one of the, you know, kind of tours, like it was 1997. So Fly was on the radio. We had just come off the Warp Tour and, you know, we had been told we're going to do this this tour. And it was Incubus opening for Sugar Ray, which, at, you know, when you think about it now, I mean, they, they're they playing like arenas right now. Um it, it was just like something from another world. Like we were like thrown in. We couldn't believe it. First of all, I mean, you know, getting to go out on these like sheds and play these giant, like, you know, even some, some bigger, bigger venues with 311 and Incubus was like dream come true. Um, you know, again, I'm going to go back to like 311 since that time we saw them at 5902 with the tour bus. Now, you know, they have three tour buses and they've got a semi truck mm -hmm. with production and we're just like, oh my! I mean, you know, we were on the radio, and we were we had a hit blowing up, but we we didn't have that ten years of of grassroots touring and and what 311 had been building. Like we we we've been doing it, but we didn't have any money. We we were still just struggling. And and once Fly hit, of course, you know, things changed a little bit, and you know, we did afford ourselves a tour bus, and you know, we stopped sharing hotel rooms with each other, like three guys in a room, and and then and, and went to one guy in a room, but. Um, another thing that was just so cool, and, and when I think back of it, it was just like the way to go because it makes things so much easier. But 311, here we, you know, we show up for day one, and it's like, you know, they've got the buses and, and the, the trucks and the production, all the stuff. And then they've got a traveling chef with all the wells and whistles. They've got, um, you know, a masseuse that travels with them. They have 
you know, production and wardrobe cases and all this stuff. We're like, whoa, dude, like, is that, that life really exists? Holy cow. Like this, and they were so generous and so cool. Like I remember one night, I don't know if it was on this tour. I think it was at the end of the tour and I, I threw my back out, you know, and I, and those guys were so cool. And, and they're, you know, like, Stan, what's wrong? I go, oh, my back. It's like, I can't play tonight. You know, I'm going to have to cancel. They're like, no, no, no. See our, see our massage therapist, you know, he or she, I can't remember. They'll work you out and then you'll be on stage in like an hour. And I'm like, nah, that's anyway. They, they forced me, they forced me to get a massage. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was fantastic. They, they totally brought me back to life. You know, catering was amazing. And they, these guys are just so generous and so nice. And they were like, you know, if you were the, the, the tech from Incubus or you were the, you know, the, the lead, if you were Nick Hexum, I mean, it's like everybody kind of was in the same thing. It's like, let's all roll together and let's make this as pleasant as possible. Like right. let's, yeah. being on the road is hard enough. And right. then, like you're away from your friends and your family and your dogs and, and you just like, it's it's fun and it's awesome, but you know you're gone. Let's say you're gone for three or four or five or eight months out of the year. It's like, you know, three eleven was like, if we're gonna be gone, let's make it nice. You know, like let's have like a great meal. Like, you know, you're you're only as good as you know how much energy you have. So they did it right, man. And and they were super. They'd have us on their buses. We would have like after parties on the, you know on the crew buses. We'd all have these dance parties. I mean, I know that Donnie Spada has been one of the guests <laughs> I saw. Yes, and, and um, you know Donnie was the ringleader for a lot of those, and uh, he was the best. You I read? Mean, the... I, I honestly like those memories to me. Are, are they were so precious, and we had so much fun, and it was all because three eleven was so damn cool. You know, they yeah. really were. You read our mind in the, the next seg segue with uh, I was going to say we spoke to Donnie and some of his shenanigans on the tour based on his comments and your comments tonight. <laughs> Sounds like there was some camaraderie. You guys got to hang out quite a bit, and there was, you know, hanging out on the buses and everything like you just described. Do you have any? Uh, uh, takes on Donnie's shenanigans because we have oh, a hundred thousand. So Donnie, his name really became Chili D. Chili, Chili D. Chili D was like, you know, and he would, so after everyone had, you know, finished the show, the bands had all showered and gotten their, you know, food or whatever, it was time to party. And when I say that, I mean, it was like, you know, no one was going to go crazy, but what the bands didn't want was the party on their buses. So the crew bus for 311 that had, Donnie and, and, you know, Yeti, whoever, all the guys, yeah. they would have these parties on the that crew bus that bus. started, you know, after everyone had kind of like cleaned up and gotten ready. And, you know, Donnie would come out and like, you know, he would find a leather thong <laughs> and he would have like a wrestling mask on and he oh, would start Lord. and we were, there was a band from England called Prodigy and Prodigy was like blowing up at the time and they had, you know, Firestarter and all these songs and we would all get on this bus. People were drinking. People were smoking weed, whatever. And this, there would be 30, 40 people in the bus bouncing. And this whole bus is just going like this. If you were outside the bus and you saw this, you'd be like, what, what in God's name is going on in there? Like 30, 40 people listening to Prodigy, Ch Chili D, r running circles, just or orchestrating everything. It was like so fun. That that became like more fun than like uh, than the tour to me. It was like, all right, crew bus party tonight. Let's go. You know, and then, you know, it would last for like an hour and then everyone would get on their buses and go off to the next day. But it, those were some really fun times and everyone had a blast and it was a really good way to let off steam and just, you know, get to know each other and high five. And the next day you're like, dude, let's do it again, you know. <laughs> well, Donnie doesn't know it yet and I haven't quite done it yet, but he has an IMDB page and I intend to update that with uh, Chippendale Dancer. Just simply Chippendale Dancer. Yeah, it was One line, like a, um, no years. more like, I wouldn't call it Chippendales. I would almost call it like, you know, it's like a, a, a S and M dancer. Cause he, he I, I don't know where he'd find these outfits, but he had like, you know, and I can't remember cause a, we were partying pretty hard, but B Chris like Farley. it was a long time ago, but you know, I remember th like thongs. He would come out in like a leopard thong and like a mask and, you know, just like he would get things, he would get the party started. I mean, he, he mm -hmm. should be a professional party starter. That's what he should do. Well, in, in addition to being an amazing tech for, you know, everybody and their mom. Yeah. Well, we got a couple photos to discuss, and if you watch some of the other episodes, if it if it ever interests you at all, uh, his episode will have a couple of those video clips and interesting photos from his uh, his wild times on stage. So, well, yeah, I still follow him on uh, Facebook, and I see his mm -hmm. posts every once in a while. And you know, those days were like when they're happening, you're like, oh, this is gonna happen forever. This is my life for till I'm dead. And then you realize, like, you know, 10 years later when that isn't happening, you're like, God, that was the best time I've ever had in my life. But, you know, I appreciate it, and I can look back and go, man, that was great. I I'm certainly glad at 55 I'm not doing, you know, 
uh, S and M dance on a, on a tour bus at, at two in the morning. But but you know, I could be persuaded. I don't know. Yeah, we're all life's weird. <laughs> Calm down at this point, yeah. And then uh, well, the other photo that I'm, I'm speaking of is, is an iconic photo that has uh, 311 Incubus and Sugar Ray outside of the NRG Studios. That's such a rad photo. Can you guys send that to my email? Absolutely. That's so bitchin'. Um, you know, I, I vaguely remember that. Like, I think, you know, I wish I had more of a, a, of a just a, a clear memory. I, I remember going to NRG. I remember being – we were in the studio – and I think they were next door. We were like an A and they were in B or they were in B and we were in A. And then I think Incubus came into like C or maybe Incubus was doing a, a guest track on a 311 track. But I know it, it was just one of those things. And I think this was maybe after the tour we did. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, if, okay. I, I don't have the chron you know chronological dates uh, memorized, but I, I just remember like, you know, NRG was in the Valley we were all coming off these kind of big records and I think we were all going back in the studio to record more. And, uh, you know, it just so happens like we were all there. Like that photo is really killer. Like I can't believe it's every guy in Incubus, every guy in 311, I think. Right. Yeah. And every, and every guy in sugar, I don't see Murphy. Did, oh, Murphy's right in the front. There you go. All right. So yeah, I mean that, that's yep. like freaking legendary. I, I yeah, my, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you guys my email afterwards and I'd love to put that as my screensaver. That That's awesome super cool yeah i just remember it was you know we nrg was the place to record like you could have like like mm -hmm. i said the chili peppers would be in one room and you know you'd have you know josh freeze and all the other people in the other rooms and you know you'd have uh, lit and then i mean it was just you know one band after the next nice very nice yeah and then yeah. they op they opened that studio b and i guess 311 was like one of the first ones or the first one to go in there in 1997 record transistor so yeah that's cool i think they might have even locked out the studio if i remember correctly like they they like they like put it on hold for like a year this is i think they, before they had the the beehive or what do they call their place the, the hive. hive yeah, yeah. The, the hive yeah so i think before they purchased uh an asset you know they they were in there and just to have a studio like that on lockout is such a luxury because you can go in there anytime and make music so you know, again, they're, they've always been super smart in making business decisions and, um, you know, being super generous to other artists and other bands and, and re really kind of like taking the trip together, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So kudos to them for having such vision at an early age and, and really making the experience great for everybody that was taking the, the ride with them. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like a comet of positive energy that just pulled like-minded along and entertained That's us totally... for years and years and years it's awesome you're 100 percent right you know Dude, it's like I live and and i'm breathe sure it. even nowadays like when they i actually went and saw them with my wife there's a place called five points amphitheater down here where we are because they got rid of irvine meadows which was our our beloved amphitheater here uh, but um every time they play you know i've kind of lost touch with the guys I'm, I'm sure like i actually saw them in huntington beach not too long i guess maybe three four years ago anyway and i said hi to them when they were coming off the stage and they're like Stan! you know but you know it is those they're gone everyone's got families now it's it's a changed life everyone's you know you, you have a select group of friends that you hang with and and you know i mean unless you have kind of like a um i guess you know if i was still kind of doing that touring world or in that in that motion i'd probably mm -hmm. still have some relationships but I've kind of pivoted and done my own thing. I still tour and do do stuff with my band, but it's it's like one offs and we do corporate dates and it's a lot more friendly for for sleeping in your own bed, if you know what I mean. Sure, right. Sure. Just enough to scratch yeah. the itch. Yeah, exactly. And there's no doubt yeah. people are eating good around your house, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously I have like a, a love for food and music and and that's kind of been my whole thing since I've been uh, you know, in in bands. But I I was always and, and to to compliment 311 with having a, a catering company or, or a chef like you know that was my position too in the band a lot was i was like sourcing good food during the day because you you wake up and you've got like 12 hours so you, you're on stage so what do you do on the tour bus do you play video games that's not me uh murphy and i played golf for a while and then we get burned out and then we'd be tired for the show so it was easy enough for me to keep a bicycle in the bay of the tour bus and then i just have a i'd have wheels so i could just go out i'd go find a you know, like a butcher shop or I'd find a fish store and I'd come back and I'd lay out all this food for everybody. And that, that, that just kept me kind of like grounded where I could just make my 
I could have my food, I could have my music, I could kind of control things a little bit, you know, obviously that didn't work all the time, but, uh, right. yeah, I, I cook, I, I, you know, I've been doing the chef thing forever and I still, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I bought into, um, some pizza places back in two, when I left Sugar A and, and, um, it's been a, a really nice thing to have, uh, you know, s something like that to fall back on, you know, we've got three pizzerias in Southern California and they're, uh, they do really well and I'm lucky to, uh, to have that as, as sort of my uh, supplemental income, you know, it's, it's really nice. Did you see a spike in uh, sales for International Pizza Day a few days ago? You know, we <laughs> always do. Awesome. And we promote it. And in fact, Mur so Murphy, who is our bass player in Sugar Ray, his wife does all of our social media and all of our marketing for our restaurants. And she says, yeah, the, um, inter the, the you know, national or international pizza day is, uh, it's a big deal. I mean, people take it seriously and, we had a lot of large parties, a lot of big orders, a lot of catering orders. So it's nice. for whatever reason, you know, yeah, it's yeah. it's a great business, and and I love being around it. I'm not in there that much. I, I hopefully just go in there to, uh, you know, keep everybody in check, and then pick up a check, and, sure. <laughs> and then I'm out of there. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> what was the name of your business, man? So it, it, ironically, it's got a music uh, background. Uh, so we bought it um, uh, about 11 years ago, but it's called Sergeant Pepperoni's Pizza Store. Wonderful. So <laughs> That's we, have dope. A light we, have, we have a light Beatles theme. Mm -hmm. We've got three of them in Orange County, and we're looking for our fourth one. And it's been a, a super great kind of transition for me. I mean, to get, you know, kind of take a break from music, go do my other passion, which is food. And, and uh, obviously, um, Jen, you mentioned like Chef Race. I, I went out on this crazy reality show. We I was a drummer in a rock and roll band for 24 years. It spent about 20 of those years on the road in the U.S. and overseas. That, that kind of was my impetus to kind of start these pizzerias when i uh, in 2013 when this all happened so um i've just been lucky i've kind of been able to you know jump from uh moving uh you know platform to moving platform and and uh and land up on my feet so i'm just gonna keep doing what i'm doing and, and hopefully uh you know someone's looking after me up there yeah yeah sergeant pepperonis huh that's uh sergeant pepperonis that's pretty Irvine, cool. well, elisa viejo and newport beach well if you're in those areas listeners Go check them out. Pepperoni, pepperoni and bacon. And tell me what it tastes like in the comments so I can go get me one later. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We, if, if you guys ever uh, venture out this way, pizza's on me. There you go. That's awesome. All Thank right. you. All right. So you were well, in the uh, OCDP brothers, correct? For sure. Yeah. Um, so there's you know, multiple ads with guys. Adrian and Chad and yourself over the years. Uh, what was it for you specifically that made those kits – just vibrate good in your hands when you're hitting them. You know what I mean? What, what, what was the sound? What was the feel that, that brought you there? You know, it, it was, uh, they had these things that the snare drums had, they were vented. So they had holes in them all, all around the circumference of the, the drum and they just had this pop to them and they just sounded so good. And then Dan, who is now Travis Barker's roadie, who is, ah. you know, uh, on tour with us. And he's been involved so hardcore in music and, and that whole crowd. And don't forget Taylor Hawkins was, was one of those yes, drummers too. Yes, Taylor too. Um, rest in peace, Taylor. Yeah. So uh, the, the drums, you know, were just, they were new and innovative and they sounded so good. And, and they had like, they just had a thing. And you could call them and go, hey, listen, I want a purple sparkle kit. And I, I need it by this tour. We're leaving in two weeks. And they'd be like, no problem. We'll get that to you. So like, the customer service, I mean, everything about it was just like, and it, it, it had like a, um, like a, a, a cult following too, because like people were like, oh my god, like these guys are all playing OCDP drums, you know, and and so, you know, I, I just fell in love with the way they sounded. They they were made very they, with a lot of craftsmanship and quality. So, um, I had two or three different kits, a bunch of snares, loved it, still do. I still have. Um, they, they made me this reggae snare with the vented holes in it. It was, you know, orange, green, and yellow. Super rad. I still have it. It's uh, one of my favorite snares. So they just did the right thing, and they got the right people on board, and, and they, uh, they they sold a lot of drums. Awesome. Yeah. So it's like musicians yeah. serving musicians. That's good stuff. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about a, a stay on. You had a, your self-title come out in 2001, and then on stay on nick came out and guest vocal how did how did that song come to the table initially for you that's a great question um so at the time you know we had, we'd finished that tour with 311 and you know i'd talked to nick a couple times about writing because he knew that i i did a lot of the writing in sugar ray like on a lot of the hits and, and a lot of the other songs like i'd bring the songs 
to the table and then we'd all collaborate and whatever. And then if they couldn't get finished, you know, I would take them and finish them myself. I'd always been kind of a strong writer and, and I always kind of showed up when I guess people weren't ready to show up or they were doing other things. So I had no, I love songwriting. I still do. I still make it a point to, to write as many tunes as I can, as much as I can. But so Nick lived in the Hollywood Hills. Um, he lived right up the street from me. I lived on Rid Path and um, he lived off of, um, Kirkland, I think, up uh, off behind, up past the Canyon Country Store on, on, on uh, I guess that was Kirkwood. Anyway, um, we'd see each other, you know, going up and down the hill and we'd wave and, you know, I, we were talking about riding together and doing something. And then we had this song and it was called Stay On and we just kind of like were fumbling with it. We didn't really know what to do with it. And I go, I got a great idea. Let's give this to Nick Hexum and see what he can do with it. And the guys are like, yeah, man, that sounds great. Let's do that. Because they... You know, we couldn't finish it or for whatever reason, like we just weren't getting it to the finish line. So I dropped it off and I literally drove to Nick's house with like, I don't even know what it was. It was probably like an MP3 or like a mini cassette or like, I don't know, maybe it was, a I, I can't remember the format it was on. It, it was probably a CD, I guess. And I put it in his mailbox, you know, I knew where he lived, but I didn't want to bother him. So I put his mailbox, I go, hey, Nick, the song's in the mailbox. Let me know like in a couple of weeks, like if he came up with him, like literally the next day, at like <laughs> noon he's like i finished it Dude, i'm like beast. of course you did of course you finished it. <laughs> you know god you know he's such a prolific writer all those guys are such great writers um and like i played it for the guys and we all just went oh my god this is freaking fantastic this is so good so again i think um you know we were all on board with it we loved all of his work we kept all the changes and we said come down to the studio we got to drop your vocal at a proper studio i think it was nrg he came in you know, the track was already done. So Ollie came in, rocked the vocals. Maybe he played some guitar on it and um, it became Stay On. And, and everyone loved it. And it was perfect. It was a perfect, like, hybrid of, like, 311, Sugar Ray. We just come off tour. Some cool vocals, some cool hooks, you know, some cool melody. And um, those are the kind of collaborations I love when they when they just work out. And, and it's like, there's not a lot of, hey, man, like, I want to change the whole song around. You're like, oh, shit, here we go. <laughs> you know, but Nick was super cool. We left him a lot of running room to, to do things. And, and he had full artistic kind of like, you know, just whatever he wanted to do. So um, I loved it. And, and yeah, I still love that song. And, and it, it, it gets a lot of play. Like I, I hear it once in a while in a, in a, you know, in a store or like on, on a Sirius or something. And it's nice to hear Nick's voice on there. Very cool. It's a great track. Yeah. It's a great that's track. That's definitely, definitely one that's stayed on my playlist since it came out. I still love that song. It's so good. You know, I got one quick fun fact about that song, and then I'll let you guys ask me another question. But um, okay. so so after we did that song, <clears throat> I think like Nick was he was really stoked on the song because I talked to him because I I love it. Like I think it's great. You know, like um, just like super inspiring. And I'm like, no, be quiet, no, don't. And I'm like, no, no, come on, tell me, tell me. <laughs> you know, I was like egging him on, and he's like, yeah, yeah. And then like honestly, I think like cut to like the next release they had, and Amber came out. Hmm. And, um, you know, I was like, God dang, Amber's a badass song. This is going to be a huge hit. You know, I just knew it because it was so vibey and cool. And next time I saw Nick was like maybe a couple months later. And he's like, he pulled me aside. I saw him out at a club or something. And we were talking and he goes, you know, after we did Stay On, like a couple days later, I wrote Amber. Because like I was so pumped from Stay On that like I just I, I love that vibe. Wow. And I just came up with Amber. So like I I want to feel like you know I I was we were the band was sort of responsible for at least inspiring Nick to come Definitely, up with Amber. Yeah. So, Definitely. So I was stoked. I'm like, do you want to give me any of the publishing? You're more than welcome to. I'll, yeah. I'll you. I, I, I love I love I love the humble nature, but like the just the entire group of these bands that you know were in that energy trail that we were talking about. It, it was all inspirational. You're you're all the reasons why you were what you were because of the surrounding and the environment and that's uh just doesn't get better than that i truly believe that's that's a factor and and whether or not anyone wants to admit it it's kind of like you know the, the, what do they say the, the the greatest form of, of flattery is is you know uh imitation um imitation yeah so so it's like if you want to borrow from sugar a great if i want to borrow from 311 great if i want to take a a, a little uh inspiration from incubus or corn or or you know whoever like that's kind of a tip of the cap and and thank you and and yeah if it works out great and uh if no one ever talks about it that's fine too but i was i was actually really stoked that nick told me that i was like man that's cool like you were inspired to write amber amber went on to be obviously that's you know, wonderful it's like one of my wife's favorite songs i'm like 
Why can't our songs be some of your favorite songs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. That's a great. That was a nice little addition to that. That's a great. Yeah, that was, good. Great story. Yeah, I, I'll never forget. I, I love stuff like that. You know. We're happy for you, man. It's great yeah. to to have things like that to look back on in your career and be proud of. And uh, some of my best stuff has always come from just having an open mind and and letting someone else put eyes on something. So yeah, it's always that's always great. That's always great. Um. So back to the cooking thing a little bit, if you don't mind. Like a uh, sure. bunch of guys out there listening, maybe maybe gals as well. But what, what's the one re- recipe that like everyone should know? Like the most basic thing, in your opinion, that is universal or, or just easy for anyone? Yeah. yeah, I'm not much of a cook, so I would love to hear this answer. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of loaded question because there's so many different uh, ways to answer that. But, you know, I would say like I would say the basics and I don't know if everyone eats, you know, this food, but like if you can cook an egg well, like seriously, if you can make yeah. like a, an omelet or you can e- even scramble an egg like like correctly. Sure. That is a really good start because, I mean, you're working with a, 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 a cooking vehicle like a pan. You're working with like um, some kind of fat, like a butter or an oil. And then you're, you know, it, it, there's a lot to it, but at the same time, it's super simple and you have to season and taste accordingly. But like, I mean, I, I just say start easy. There's so like, we live in the YouTube world of like, you can Google anything. Like I fixed my, uh, you know, a cabinet the other day. Cause I, I, I went onto YouTube and figured out how to do it. So like yeah. cooking is like, no, there's no longer guesswork. Cause you could just like Google it or you can go on YouTube and find a way, but if you can just kind of master making like a, a very simple omelet with just like maybe cheese and a cheese omelet and not burn it. And, you know, there shouldn't be any color or brownness on the egg. You know, th- these are kind of like fundamentals. But, um, you know, again, we roll out fresh pasta a lot at my house because my wife's Italian. And, and but I've been doing it for like 30 years. So, like, I mean, mm-hmm. I do it kind of like I play drums. I, I look at it as like a challenge. But at the same time, there's fundamental stuff that I know for just from being in the kitchen so much and reading and researching and watching and, and trying to learn. You know, um, I have like 122 cookbooks or something like it's kind of like if I'm not doing anything music, I'm doing um, food, you know, like. I've just started doing some stuff on Instagram where I'm like trying to do some like little cooking stuff and it's fun for me. I'm cooking anyway. So why not turn the camera on in my kitchen and film it and put it on, you know, TikTok or put it on an Instagram reel. And, you know, it's, it's fun for me. It's an outlet. It's what I love to do. And um, you just can't panic. You know, if you burn something, throw it out and start over. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to tell us about uh, uh, the, the, the game show that you went on, how, how that came to be and what, uh, what came of it for you? Yeah, of course. So, so basically um, it's funny. I left Sugar Ray, like, you know, it, it was, it was kind of time to, to hang up my drumsticks, if you will. Like it was 2012, I think in 2010, maybe the band should have called it quits, but we, we kind of kept the, you know, running on fumes for a couple of years and things weren't the greatest for us. And, it just kind of got a little bit depressing and our records weren't selling like they used to. And everyone was kind of like, yeah, you know, like the, the money we were receiving wasn't as much. It just kind of was like, all right, like this is kind of like, but I kind of saw it coming because I started producing stuff and writing with other people like Nick and back in the day, like I was like, this isn't going to last forever, man. This is like, you know, unless you're like the stones or, or you two or something like, I I don't see this lasting my lifetime, especially like with our group of guys. Cause as great as it was all the time, there was also a lot of fighting. It's like being married to like four other guys, you know, it's like right. you have your ups, your downs, your ins, your outs. It's like, it's very, you know, someone's in a good mood one day, someone's in a bad mood. This guy's don't talk to him, talk to this guy, talk to it. It gets, it gets to be complicated. Um, but we had great times. We had bad times. Um, but I guess, so when I decided to leave in 2012, I have a very a type personality wife. So my wife is like, you know, I told her, I'm like, I'm leaving the band. I'm all good. I've saved some money. You know, I'm, I'm not a complete financial idiot. Like I've, I've done okay. Um, and I, I'm going to take like a year off to figure out what I'm going to do, you know, because at the time, this was 2012, it's 2024 now. So yeah, I guess I was probably like mid forties, 43. Mm-hmm. So I just was like, you know, I'm going to take a year off to figure it out. And she's like, no, you're not you're not taking a year off. Like you're going to, you need a job. And I'm like, Whoa, Whoa. whoa, whoa." I go, listen, I didn't buy a Lamborghini. I'm fine. Like I've invested pretty well. I had some people help me. Like I'm good. 
she's like, no, that's, I'm not, you're not going to sit around the house. And, and I go, well, that's not really my MO. I don't really sit around the house, but um, she was really adamant about me doing something. So she goes, honey, I found the perfect thing for you. I saw this ad on Craigslist. I'm like, uh Oh, that sounds terrible. already. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she goes, look at this ad. It said, do you like cooking? Do you like adventure? Do you like thrills? Do you like travel? And I'm like, I actually like all those things. What is this? And she goes, it's a, it's an audition for a cooking show on BBC America called Chef Race. And the person who's in charge is Jamie Oliver, who happened to be one of oh, my yeah. favorite chefs in the world. Got like a hundred restaurants made, you know, he's got, no, he's the number one selling author in, in England from for 30 or 40 cookbooks. He's, he's a big deal over there. I actually and sat so through I'm a like, taping of Letterman with him. Like I was in the studio at really? Letterman and it was, yeah, it was Jamie Oliver and Kelly Ripa. Yeah. No yep. way. Yep. He, he's a fantastic guy. I, I've never really actually met him, but I just know he's a fantastic guy just from, from hearing everybody. Anyway, long story short, she goes, you have to go to this audition this Saturday up in LA. And I go, oh, that sounds terrible again. I, I, I'm out, you know, I'm, I go, I, I'm, we're not, you know, we're not like that up. up. We're, we're okay. We're, we're going to hang. We're, we're not going to go to the poorhouse right now. We're, we're okay. So she's like, no, go to the audition. So she talks me into it. I'm I got, my friends came over the night before and they were trying to pump me up. We drank a ton of wine. Next day I'm like hungover and I got to go to this audition and you were supposed to bring an item of food that shows off your skill. So I'm like, Oh God, everything I'm going to make and drive to LA, it's going to turn into crap because you got to serve a lot of food, like right on the spot. Like sure. who wants a, a, a French fry that's an hour old? Nobody, you know? So I, I decide I have this uh, portable um, stove that I use for camping. And I'm like, I'm bringing the stove and I'm going to make all of my stuff on the fly in the wow. parking lot. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to serve it to them hot and fresh. And she's like, that's a great idea. You know? So wow. I drive up to LA with my wife, like I said, hungover. <laughs> I get there. I open the back of her. She had a Volvo station wagon and I'm cooking back there. I've got all my stuff. My, my I've got my stove and my pans and I'm making this dish. I don't even fucking remember what the dish was to tell you the truth. Um, I think it was like, uh, I did a pasta. I think I did a, uh, I did a ravioli that I, I made the ravioli the night before and I was making it in the pan anyway. And I get there and they, they, they call me in and I bring in the stove and I make the ravioli and they know I was in sugar a, and they're like, this is like the best ravioli we've ever had. Like, who are you? I go, I don't know. I just got, I just left my band after 25 years. And I, my wife said I should go on this show. And they're like, do you want to go on the show? I go, not really, but I, I'm interested. And they're like, I think that's all it took. They're like, like a day later, I got an email. You've been selected as one of the 16 guests on Chef Race. And I'm like, oh, my God. So now I'm like, oh, shoot. Now I'm on the hook. Committed. <laughs> I'm committed. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, you, you need to show up in two weeks at this hotel in Santa Monica. You start your journey then. And I'm like, they didn't tell us anything, really. Yeah. It's all like, it was all like kind of encrypted codes. This is the most bizarre setting for a meal. I'm in a bathroom. Anyway, you left from the Santa Monica Pier. You had to get to New York City. It took 16, 14 weeks, sorry, 14 weeks. And you raced up, you know, throughout the United States with all these challenges. And, and I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I need to go home and like take some time off. I just got off the road. I'm tired. Anyway, I, I went on the show and um, I was scared because I'd been pretty comfortable, you guys. Like, you know, after 311 spoiled me with catering and, mm. and massage okay. therapists and nice hotels, you know, like we were living the pretty good life. And so now I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Anyway, I signed up. I said, I'm going to do this for my wife. I'm going to do it for me. I think I can at least get pretty far. And so I, I just week after week, I was like I, I was cooking up a storm. I was doing the best I could. I've been studying a long time. And week after week, you know, I just started winning, you know, and I'm like, wait a minute. Like, maybe there's something to this. And then I started like I grew a mustache. I started doing like thousands of or not thousands, but lots of push ups every day. I lost 30 pounds. I just became this like animal. I was like, I'm going to win. Ah! <laughs> you know? And so I, like week 10 came, I won. Week 10, 11 came, I won. Week 12 came, I won. My, I, now I've got this like huge mustache and I'm wearing like tight shirts because I'm all like freaking <laughs> jacked up and like I'm just ready to win. And sure enough, after week 14, you know, I ended up winning the whole entire contest. And, uh, you know, it was it was one of those things where I just kind of became like, uh, uh, like Robert De Niro, like in Taxi Driver, like I just was like 
I was possessed and not even really because I wanted to win. I just wanted to prove to myself I could do something other than being a rock band. Mm -hmm. And it was cool, you know, and I won a hundred thousand bucks, you know, wow. like, and I won like bragging rights and I beat down all these guys that were giving me shit for weeks. And so it <laughs> actually afforded me the opportunity to go into um, my current business, which is Sergeant Pepperoni's Pizza Store. And we opened our first one like um, within a year of me winning the show. So nice. it all worked out, you know, like I said, I'm jumping from moving platform and jumping over, you know, falling pianos and all these things that are happening to me. So, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been really radical and I've, I wouldn't change it for a thing. Not going to do any more reality cooking shows. People ask me, Oh, you should go on chopped. <laughs> I'm like, nah, I'm good. I won the first one. That's it. I retired. I'm good. I'm cooking from home. I'll, I'll do my little Instagram videos and I'm happy. Yeah. Stay batting a thousand, man. Why not? That's, that's the, what I'm saying, that's man. Awesome. I could go yeah. and lose anyone. I mean, then I'd just be like, oh, that guy's all washed up. I could just hear people now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Congratulations on that, man. Uh, no, it was fun. I mean, yeah. and it opened a lot of doors for me in the culinary world and, and, you know, like got me into the Sergeant Pepperoni's gig. So, you know, they say when, when one window closes, another door opens or vice versa. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm open to anything. I, at this point in my life, like I said, like, if you told me, like, you know, I, I, I like to think of myself as an entrepreneur and, and like a businessman at this point, because it's not all like even being in a band. I mean, I was manager, basically. I mean, you know, we had a manager, but up until we got him, like we we all did it. Like I booked the shows. We made the, the grind. Flyers. We, yeah. We, yeah. The drummer usually does all that stuff. I think it's like for some reason there's like a pulse behind, you know, the drummer and, and no pun intended. But <laughs> I don't know, like someone's got to do it. And a lot sure. of times those guys are not around. So it's like, I'll do it. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, fire <laughs> up. So well, that's, good. that's, that's who I am. I'm still, you know, I look at all opportunities to come my way and if there's some uh, opportunity or if I like it, or if I'm interested, I'll, I'll take a good look at it. Cool. Yeah. That's the way to do. Have an open mind. Yeah. He's got to do it. You know, so do I don't you, like saying no. I don't like say, I like saying yes, and then and then you know if I have to like go back on it, and then, but you know, no is just such a. It's just so like, no. I'm like, yeah, let's try it. Let's, let's give it a shot. Yes theory. They call that the, yeah. the yes theory. I, I'm in. I'm into it. All right, so we're kind of wrapping up here. Let's uh. Let's ask you about what your favorite 311 songs or albums. Are. I mean, yeah, I, it's like I'm such a fan. I, I really, really dig what they've done since the beginning. And just even their, like how down um, like didn't hit right away, you know, like that took a while for that mm -hmm. to break. And um, but I do like Transistor a lot for some reason. And like. I'll, but I'll go back to like, you know, like the first, the early stuff too, when they, when I, when I go to see them live and they play that stuff and the crowd ignites, I mean, I'm a huge fan. I mean, I, again, I touched on Amber and, and, you know, I mean, all, all that, like just, it just all to me is like, I don't really think there's like a bad 311 record. Like, I just think that there's like some songs that weren't as good as some other ones, but everybody's got that, you sure. know, but I'm an album okay. guy. I just got a turntable. And so um, I'm super excited. So I, I'm, I, I've had so much 311 vinyl in the past, but then there has been like a thing where it's like I had a storage unit that, that, that caved in and all, the, all my vinyl was gone and damaged yeah. and all that stuff. So I'm in the process Ouch. of rebuying a lot of vinyl right now. And it's super mm -hmm. fun for me because I go to like, you know, um, flea markets and garage sales and all that stuff, but it's really hard to find 311 vinyl. So I think I'm gonna have to buy a lot of it, but yeah. I don't mind. I, li I like supporting the cause, you know, it's, that mm -hmm. stuff is, I love dropping needles on stuff and walking away and just do it. Like I cook to, to, I've been cooking so much. The only problem with having a, a turntable is that, you know, when the record ends, you got to go ah, flip it over, you know, right. hands, yeah. but yeah. that's, that's small potatoes. You know, I'm usually, uh, you know, in an apron and I wash my hands, flip the record and, and, go about my business but um yeah maybe trend, the blue out i mean it's just they're, they're all like they all have a special place when i heard them and when i either were touring with them and um you know i i, I love it are they are they making new records right now or are they going are they they're, are they, they right are now? they're in the process they i guess they finished recording and they're working on mixing their 14th album. yeah it's coming Jesus Christ. it's coming <laughs> we're all super That's psyched amazing. for it 311 days coming up so we're hoping to hear at least an announcement of when maybe then or close after. So yeah, new music that very soon. Super cool. Everyone's kind of like, when? 
I'm like, I bet. I mean, you know, like, it's not like there's not. I mean, like I said, we went to Five Point uh, Amphitheater last summer, sold out 311. You know, I'm in like the fifth row. I had a friend who gave me some really great tickets, and I'm in the fifth row in awe. You know, like I'm, you know, I used to tour with these guys and play with them and write songs with them. And, you know, I'm not in that position anymore, but I, I look at it and I go, these guys are still bringing the thunder. Dude. They still come out and do the drum thing. They're all sounding good. They're looking good. They've got their health. I mean, Nick's super and sh- they're all in shape. And I just, it's just, it's inspiring to see them keep going. And as five guys that are still friends and being able to like put up with each other for that long, that's saying a lot because, you know, people go in and out of stages and phases and it's like, Oh, what's wrong with, uh, you know, what's wrong with essay this week? Why is he being so mean? Like, it's just, you never know what people are going through. So it's just to maintain that 14 albums. I mean, that's like, I mean, that's, that's up there with like, I mean, that's how long have they been together? We're approaching. They are coming up on 34 years. 34 years. Holy shit balls. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. I mean, God bless them. They should, I mean, get to 40 and see what happens, but I, I don't see them stopping. I mean, why would they stop? Just keep touring, making records and having fun. I mean, yeah, that's your livelihood. And that's what they love to do. You can tell when they play it. I mean, how much they love it. I mean, that's just kind of like no brainer. That says it all, man. That says it all. Yep. And we were actually going to say uh, they're approaching 34 years. You know, what what words and, and message would you like to convey to them? But you just did that, man. You know, you really did. You gave them the love and the props. And uh, it's, it's it is a testament to, to all the people that came – through the 90s and and uh we're a part of that machine so we appreciate and I truly you joining believe that i mean that's that's like a heartfelt sincere wish for those guys is you know to keep it going and, and i'm so happy for them and and the, the the way they were so generous to to all the bands they've brought out on tour with them and all mm-hmm. that stuff and you know that stuff speaks for itself because you know you can't get to where they they are now and to continue doing this by by being you know not above the board and not cool to other bands and not not forthright and just like that'll catch up with you like that that stuff will end your career like if you're an egomaniac or you're like you know if you don't interact with the other bands or if you're talking shit on people like that stuff is over like no one you can't do that anymore and and who would want to like like life's too short man good job good job 311 god bless you thank you for everything you did for sugar ray Woo, the balloons that's great (laughs) yeah excellent well, man, we really do appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today and share your story and, uh, you know, your time with 311 and your time after. We wish you continued success with your restaurants. And I really want to get out there and have some pie. So if there's another oh, yeah. reason I can get out hit there. Me up. Hit me up, guys, for sure. Well, we'll we have you on you, Discord uh, now. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, keep me in the loop and, and vice versa. You know, we're, uh, you know, I'm in the loop. I'm doing music. I'm doing food. Uh, you know, that thing. I got a family and, and uh, you know, just Keep on keeping on and chugging on. Right on, dude. Did you want to plug the band? I know you said you're doing light work whenever, you know, corporate gigs, but did you want to, what was the name of your sure. band? Sure. I mean, it's, you know, so I got together and this will be the, uh, you know, my, my uh, parting goodbye. But yeah, the band's called The Side Deal. And, um, you know, it's a combination of guys from other bands that got, you know, kind of like orphaned. And so, um, you know, it's a couple of my buddies from this band, Pawn Shop Kings and, uh, we have Johnny from uh, Oingo Boingo who plays bass mm. with us. And then Frank Symes, he was in The Who. He was uh, mm-hmm. Roger Daltrey's and Mick Jagger's musical director along with Stevie wow. Nicks. He's, yeah, he's really rad. The side deal, we've got a couple songs on Spotify and iTunes. Um, we're going to release, we made a record right before COVID. And, um, you know, obviously the world friggin' ended, uh, you know. So yeah. we're going to try to release uh, our, our record or at least a bunch of singles in 2024 so we've been working on that so i'll let you guys know but yeah check out the side deal on uh, spotify right on well again right thank on, you guys. everybody thank Peace, you for man. watching the and 311 women, thank you Jen. thank you guys yeah you're welcome yeah. thanks everybody for Good watching work out there. 311 Good work odyssey out there. podcast all right you guys peace out man take care later bye later